This is Back to the Bible with pastor and Bible teacher Brian Clark. Today, you'll discover some very strategic truths to help you battle temptation and grow in your relationship with the Lord. Later in the program, Brian will be in the studio with Arnie Cole and Kara Whitney for a candid discussion about the lies that can trip us up. Now here's Brian Clark with today's message. We talked about in chapter one that God is capital G, small o, d, which is the Hebrew Elohim, which is the big creator God, the sovereign God, the, the big God of the universe. And at the end of chapter one, that God is so big that he feels far away. But in chapter two, we're introduced for the first time to the Lord God. Whenever you see capital L-O-R-D, that's Yahweh or Jehovah. That's the intimate God. That's the personal God of Israel. And so we're introduced to this intimate God that, that the big God of the universe is also intimate and very intimately created us to be intimate with him and to one another. It's very warm. It's very close. It's very personal. And notice in Genesis 2, 16, when God made his statement to Adam, he was the Lord God. This was an intimate father explaining this to his children. Notice in chapter 3, verse 1, God is still referred to as the Lord God who created the beasts of the field. But an interesting thing happens in verse 1 when the serpent enters into the dialogue. The serpent doesn't talk about God in those terms. He uses Elohim once again saying, God seems far away. This God couldn't possibly care about you. This God is way out there. This God really couldn't be good. He's too big. And when Eve repeats the line, she uses that same name for God, or at least that's how the author records it, as a way of saying Eve was feeling like God was far away. And we aren't reintroduced to the personal God until verse 8, when Adam and Eve have sinned and the personal God, Lord God, comes looking for his children. And once again, we see an image of a very personal, intimate God wondering where his children have gone. The names of God are very significant in the theology of this chapter because when we are being tempted and when we are doubting the goodness of God, God seems far away. And that's when we are in a dangerous area. That's when we are very vulnerable to temptation because God feels like he's out there. And we begin to question his goodness. And we're starting down a slippery slope that's going to get us in trouble. Well, the serpent's crafty and he's very effective. In verse 4, he moves on to the second lie. When he says, and the serpent said to the woman, you surely shall not die. The second lie is that there are no real consequences to sin. There are no real consequences to sin. Not only is God really not good, but there are not real consequences. In other words, God's trying to scare you. God's trying to control you. God's trying to manipulate you. God doesn't want what's best for you. He wants to limit your life. God doesn't want you to have more. God wants you to have less. And so God's trying to limit you, and he's trying to kind of intimidate you, but the consequences to sin are not really real. It is interesting to notice that the serpent actually uses God's language from chapter 2 and not Eve's language from chapter 3. He does get it right. God said you will be doomed to die. Of course, he's trying to raise the intensity level as a way of saying that isn't true. It just isn't true. There will not be consequences to sin. In other words, we can make choices outside of God's will. We can do things that God has prohibited. We can experience life outside of God, and it will get better. There's more outside of that. God is a limiter. And what the serpent is saying, there's a whole lot more life out there beyond what God has allowed. And if she's starting to doubt the goodness of God, that's very effective. You know, if some of you were to be honest in your heart of hearts, you would say that you're kind of sitting in a pile that was made because you have made some bad choices because you bought into this lie. Somewhere along the way, you began to question the goodness of God. And somewhere along the way, you decided, I'm going to take charge of my own life, and I'm going to make my own choices. And somehow you believed that you would be the first person in history ever to make sin work in your favor. Somehow it would bring you more joy, 
more pleasure, more happiness. Somehow it would work and give you more than what God wants to give you. And the enemy convinced you that there really are not consequences for that choice. And so you made that choice. You're experiencing the consequences of your decision and you know that you have been had. Because the enemy is a deceiver and he's a liar. And what he says isn't true. There are consequences to sin. There is no more life than what God offers. God does not want us to have less. God wants us to have more. But it must be done his way. And the core of that is believing God really is good. James describes this in the New Testament. When he describes this process of temptation and sin, he uses the analogy of childbirth. And he talks about conception, and and the child is conceived, and then the child grows to the point in the womb where he or she's ready to be delivered. And at the point of delivery, everyone is expecting joy, and everyone is expecting happiness. But when the child is born, the child is stillborn. The child is dead. And what we expected to be such a joyous occasion turned out to be a very sorrowful, painful event. And he says that's the picture of temptation. At first, we conceive the sin in our minds. And that's this whole idea of questioning God's goodness. And maybe God isn't so good, and maybe I need to take charge of this area of my own life and do my own thing outside of God's plan. And we conceive of that, and we kind of feed it and nourish it, and pretty soon it comes to term, and it is born into the action. And we do whatever it is was conceived. And when we do that, we are expecting joy. Somehow we're doing this because we think it will deliver the goods. But when the action is born, it is still born. There isn't joy, there is sorrow. There isn't life, there is death and you realize you have been had, you have been lied to. It wasn't what you thought it would be. Well, there's a progression to all of this. When we start to doubt the goodness of God, and the positive becomes less positive, and the restrictions become more restrictive, and we start to think that maybe the consequences won't be all that severe, and then we start to question whether there will be consequences at all, there's one more step in that. Maybe sin isn't even sin at all. That's the third lie. Shows up in verse 5. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. The third lie is that you can be like God and decide for yourself what is right and what is wrong. Now, when the serpent said, you can be like God, knowing good from evil, some people take that to mean that Adam and Eve entered into experiencing evil on a first-hand basis, so they actually did know good and evil. But that makes no sense, because the allurement is a positive thing. And in that sense, they are not like God, because God doesn't know evil experientially. When we talk about how God knows evil, it means that God knows what is good and God knows what is evil. So the lie that was perpetrated was that you can be like God. You can decide what is good, and you can decide what is evil. It's what we call in our culture today moral relativism, that there are no moral absolutes. There is no standard of right and wrong. You decide what is right and wrong for you, and everybody just kind of makes it up as we go. So the progression is God may not be as good as we thought he is, And maybe the consequences of sin aren't all that severe. As a matter of fact, maybe this sin isn't really sin at all. You're listening to Back to the Bible. If you'd like to listen again, visit backtothebible.org. That's backtothebible.org. Now, back to Brian Clark with today's study. If you imagine a boundary around me. Imagine it's, it's a rope. There was a time in our culture where within this boundary were commonly held moral beliefs, where we believe certain things are right and certain things are wrong. And when somebody stepped over the boundary, 
there was enough pressure in the culture to move that person back into conformity with moral standards. But what's happened today is when somebody steps over that boundary, rather than moving them back in the boundary, we as a culture just simply move the boundary. And so that's moral relativism. There is no real right or wrong. It's also how political candidates can say that they are pro-life, but maintain a pro-choice position because what they are saying is this is my moral choice, but there are no absolutes, so everybody has to decide that for themselves. It filters into almost everything we do. Everything's up for grabs, and that's a lie. You don't find anywhere in the Bible where God has said to us as people made in his image, I want you to know that I am no longer in charge. I want you to know you are now in charge. You can rewrite the rule book. I don't find that anywhere. As a matter of fact, I find just the opposite. Over and over, God says, I want you to know I'm in charge here. And I have made the rules, and you either choose to obey or disobey, but you cannot rewrite the rule book. There's a lot of people that think they can rewrite the rule book, but one day they'll stand before God, nose to nose, and they will find out that God makes the rules. We disobey or we uh, obey, but we've never been given the responsibility to rewrite the rules. You can see the progression of this, and obviously Eve is in trouble as she's sliding into temptation. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. It's worth noting that Adam wasn't somewhere in the garden playing golf through all of this, but the Hebrew is very clear, Adam was with Eve. He was right there at her side. He heard every word of this conversation from beginning to end, and he passively stood by and let it happen. It's also interesting to notice the correlation between verse 6 and what John said in his letter thousands of years later when he was talking about the world and the temptation in the world. He said, in the world there is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Nothing has changed for thousands of years. It's exactly what was going on all the way back in Genesis 3, 6. It's the lust of the flesh, it was good for food. It's the lust of the eyes, it was desirable to look at. It's the boastful pride of life, you can be like God. Nothing's changed. Same strategy, same lies, then and now. Well, verse 7, it all comes unraveled. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. The end of chapter 2 was the wonderful statement, and they were both naked and there was no shame. Beautiful description of what God wanted. But now suddenly they know they are naked. Suddenly they are covered with shame. Suddenly they are hiding from God, and we, we understand that everything's coming unraveled. But at the core of this discussion is really the discussion related to the goodness of God. Do we really believe that God is good? Because that's what the enemy is going to chip away at all the time in our lives. If he can convince us that maybe God isn't all that good, maybe there's some joy, maybe there's some pleasure, maybe there's something out there where I can experience more outside of God, then I take responsibility for my life. I'm going to do it my way. And what we've said is, God, I don't think you can be trusted with this area of my life. I'm going to do it myself. And at the core of that is a lack of belief that God is really good. I'm sure some of you say, you know, that's easy for you to say. That's easy for you to say because you don't know my life. You haven't walked in my shoes. You haven't had my experiences. It's hard for me to believe God is good because of what I've been through. I want to tell you something. It isn't easy for me to say that. It isn't easy for me to say that at all. Because I've been there. I've done time in the trenches. I grew up in a home where my dad was confined to a bed. He was totally blind. He was totally confined to a bed. I never knew him any other way but that. 
I never played ball with my dad. I never went for a walk with my dad. My dad never saw me with his eyes. But every day was filled with intense pain and suffering as rheumatoid arthritis just twisted his body into knots. And I know what it's like for 20 years to wonder, where is God in all this? And I know what it's like to feel like God is far away and to pray year after year and God doesn't seem to listen. And more than that, sometimes God doesn't seem to care. I know what it's like to wonder how would a good God allow this in one of his children? So I've done my time in the trenches. I know what that's like for over 20 years. But at the core of my being, I believe that God is good. Because the goodness of God is not determined by life's circumstances, it's determined by God's character. And I will grant you there are things in this life that cannot be understood. I don't know why they have to be that way. But I do believe in the God of Genesis 1 and 2, that this is a good God. Just a few days before my surgery, I had a discussion with my oldest daughter. And I said, if the unexpected happens and I die on that table, you need to know God is still good. This hasn't changed anything. There are things in life we cannot understand, but it doesn't change the fact that God is a good God. As a matter of fact, God is so good that he's made it possible for us to spend eternity together as a family, and it cost him the life of his son. And one day we will spend eternity in a place where there is no sorrow, and there is no pain, and there is no sin. We will return to an environment that was thrown away because of sin. But to get us there, it cost God his son. There is no question that God has demonstrated his goodness and how deeply he wants us to experience the goodness that only he can give. If we're willing to place our trust in Jesus as our Savior and enter into God's goodness. I'll grant you there are things in life that cannot be understood. They cannot be explained. But God is good. And if we don't believe that, we will find ourselves over and over giving in to temptation and suffering the consequences of those choices. Up next, Brian Clark joins us in the studio with Back to the Bible CEO Arnie Cole and author Kara Whitney for a conversation about today's study. Brian, thanks so much for sharing your personal story today. Do us a favor and tell us a little bit more about your dad, who actually served an important role here at Back to the Bible for over 20 years, wasn't it? Yeah, in one way or another. I mean, I I think it's easy for people to listen to a preacher say God is good, and they just think we lived charmed lives untouched by real problems. So I think it's important for people to understand the first 20 years of my life, all I knew was seeing my dad in excruciating pain 24 hours a day, seven days a week for over 20 years. That's My dad was totally blind. He lived in excruciating pain every single day. I, I never knew a day other than that. I don't ever remember my dad walking, throwing a ball, any of that. All I remember was my dad in pain. But he was a man of great faith. He was very positive. Uh, He didn't question God. But there's a reality to that. And then when I got married and started having kids, I think for the first time in my life, I realized, wait a minute, this is normal? What I grew up with is not normal. I mean, my mom slept on a couch next to his bed for 20 years as his caregiver. And so then you wrestle with, do I define God on the basis of circumstances or on the basis of what God has said about himself in the scripture? So when I say God is good, it comes from my belief that God tells the truth, not necessarily based on the circumstances of life. Well, you mentioned that there's uh, strategic lies that Satan likes to use. Can you give us those three? Yeah, I think the three in Genesis 3 that, that come back over and over again is one is God is not as good as you think he is. So God is more restrictive than generous. Number two, there's no real consequences to sin. 
And number three is I'm free to be my own God. And as my own God, life is better. It's more. So, Brian, talk more about relativism. What are its roots? Yeah, so that's pretty common conversation these days. And philosophically, people would root it back to certain people, but it actually roots back to Genesis chapter 3. That is the third lie that Adam and Eve can choose to be like God and decide for themselves what is right or wrong. So relativism roots back to our longing as people made in the image of God to be God ourselves. But the truth is nobody actually lives that way. So even though people in our culture would claim to be relativists, at the end of the day, there's causes they believe in, there's things that they believe are right or wrong, certain tragedies happen in the world, and instinctively they know that was evil. If somebody robs them, they have a clear sense that's not right. So at the end of the day, nobody lives that way. It's just kind of a clever excuse to live as we want to live and believe there's no rules and there's no accountability. Brian, the enemy is just so crafty. Uh, He's knocking people down left and right. And when we see this happening, we need to remember to pray for these people and to look for some openings to share Jesus with them. Yeah, I think it's really helpful to think with the unbelievers around me, I don't have to correct everything. I don't have to argue about everything. I don't have to try and fix everything. They're not the enemy. They're victims of the enemy. I'm a firm believer if what you watch in the media stirs up anger toward other people, that's counterproductive to the gospel. I don't want to be angry with people I've never even met, simply around political issues. So I understand they're victims of the enemy. And my desire is to get to the cross and introduce them to what Jesus has done and how Jesus has radically changed my life. So part of the challenge is to figure out where the message of Jesus intersects their life in a way they would find meaningful. And that just takes a little conversation and thought. Thanks for engaging God's Word today here on Back to the Bible. If you'd like to listen again, visit backtothebible.org. That's backtothebible.org. Tomorrow, Brian Clark shares another encouraging study from God's Word to help you stand firm in your faith. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for the Friday edition of Back to the Bible right here on this station. To listen again or find out more about our speakers, come to backtothebible.org. Thank you.